Chris Oh, we definitely have. We definitely have a quorum, that's for sure. Yeah, we do. Okay, uh, shall we begin? So everybody, welcome to our Earth Day version of Transit Riders Council. Uh, there's a lot of news to get out, uh, needless to say. Uh, but first, may we have an approval of today's agenda. This is a glad to the agenda. All right, the agenda's been moved. Any objections? All right, how about the minutes? Uh, anyone have a chance to review the minutes? Any corrections or additions? Or can we get an approval of the minutes? I approve them. Yeah. All right, thank you, Stuart. I'll uh, second. All right, so let's get into the heart of, of the meeting. Um, because yesterday's board meeting was one day in advance of Earth Day, uh, it was important to show how much our transit, including our commuter rail system, contributes to the clean air of this region. And uh, we were told yesterday that 17 million tons of dangerous emission are prevented by having our transit system, uh, which is, I thought it might've been higher, but that's, that's pretty high, 17 million tons. So that is certainly good news. Um, um, let's see, what else can we tell you? Um, as far as COVID goes, the rates are continuing to drop among MTA employees, which is good news. We're down to a 1.4% rate, uh, which is the lowest it's been. Uh, the deep cleaning of the system is continuing, uh, even with the, with the uh, just, shut, just two hours uh, shutdown. Uh, we were hoping that we would have heard an announcement that uh, there was a date for the complete reopening and restoration of 24 seven. We did not get that yesterday. Uh, we still seem to believe that it's coming relatively soon, but no dates have been given as of yet. They are embarking on a take the train campaign to bring more riders back to the system. Um, you should start seeing ads and hearing um, uh, audio ads to that effect uh, in the, within the next uh, week or two, uh, because this is a serious effort, this take the train campaign. Um, and obviously, if you ride, you've noticed that ridership seems to be increasing, which is, which is great. Um, there was a rather long debate over the crime statistics and what they mean. And um, anybody that watched the meeting yesterday was certainly, it was certainly obvious that uh, Chief O'Reilly and uh, Interim President Sarah Feinberg did not see eye to eye on what the statistics mean. Um, Chief O'Reilly was stating that crime, major crimes are down. Um, and um, uh, interim president Feinberg uh, kept reiterating that uh, that's great, but if people don't feel safe, they won't come back and we need to do more. We need more police officers. And it sort of got into a battle between who won't give the police officers, which is obviously the city of New York versus um, the, the MTA uh, there were some interchanges between uh, board members on this topic, and it got to be quite quite a to-do. If you read today's uh, news, you, you will see this argument over crime and uh, is it really down? And if it is, why aren't people feeling safe? What's being done about the mentally challenged that are in the system, which everybody believes is an ongoing problem and must be dealt with? Um, 644 officers have been added. Uh, uh, Interim President Feinberg reiterates we need more. Uh, I believe we do as well. Um, I have seen uh, police officers throughout the system and people do seem to feel better when, when they do see them. Um, serious crimes remain up. Uh, Chief McGran, who is the uh, MTA police chief for, for the commuter rails reported that serious crimes remain down on commuter rail as well. Vandalism, unfortunately, is up. Machines are being vandalized, uh, ticket machines, metro card machines. Um, so this, this is a concern um, in commuter rail territory. 
um, they obviously are continuing to be um, um, vandalized in the subways as well, which is why people are able to sell swipes. Uh, they, they disable the machines. That's one of the reasons that Omni will do away with that practice, we hope. Um, and um, Omni is continuing. Uh, there are increasing numbers of Omni taps throughout the system. When all fare types are available later this year, it is pretty, it is pretty obvious that Omni will really take off. Uh, you'll be able to use your phone. You'll be able to use an MTA issued Omni card. Um, they won't hit commuter rail until 2022, but it's coming for sure. And in a discussion I had with Al Poutre, I wanted to make sure that Omni and the Omni system will allow for the kinds of reduced fares that we have been promoting, such as Atlantic Ticket and Freedom Ticket. And you will get a Freedom Ticket slash Atlantic Ticket update later, later in this uh, meeting from Bradley. Um, so, so the crime discussion did take up a, a reasonable amount of time yesterday and uh, was not resolved. Uh, but as far as finances go, um, the state budget is $143 million favorable now. And, and there's an additional 98 million from the 1920 to, from the, uh, excuse me, um, from the 1920 to 21 budget. Um, um, that doesn't make any sense. What, what did they say? Um, from the, from last year's budget yeah. to this year's budget. There, yeah, there was to, a, yeah. 98 million 2020 to 2021 is what it should say right. budget which is good news and um uh david keller reported that fairbox revenue is 264 million favorable tolls are 173 million dollars favorable and subsidies are 311 million dollars favorable however just so you don't leave with a smile on your face this portion they are still significantly below pre-pandemic levels. And if that doesn't come back, there will be trouble down the road in 2023 or thereabouts. So we, we know what the McKinsey report uh, said. Um, it is the most pessimistic that you won't see pre-pandemic numbers uh, uh, come back until maybe 2023 at the earliest. Um, we hope that is not the case. It was probably a safe thing for McKinsey to do, but we hope to see them back much more quickly and perhaps the Take the Train campaign will help as well as people coming back to offices and the city of New York is doing a new tourism uh, boost campaign and that might help as well. Broadway theaters opening will certainly help. Uh, restaurants staying open later uh, and clubs reopening and staying open. All of that will help. Um, we also got a pretty amazing presentation yesterday on the Penn Station Master Plan from uh, Construction and Development's Chief uh, General Lieber. Um, this is a really amazing, uh, and, and I, I urge you to, uh, we're gonna send you a link so you can see um, the pages of this uh, report and what, what various versions of the Penn Station Master Plan look like. Some have two levels, some have one level with a sweeping atrium with tons of light. Um, Lots more uh, space for, for movement and stores and restaurants, uh, very distinct train signs and um, destination boards. I asked if they will be uh, for their respective uh, services, whether it be Amtrak, New Jersey Transit or Long Island Railroad or Metro North, because all four services will be serving Penn Station. Uh, in fact, two of Metro North's services will be serving Penn Station. Uh, including the Penn Access plan for the New Haven line and the Hudson line will be coming down the Amtrak uh, West Side line into Penn Station at some point. And even West of Hudson service is scheduled to come into Penn Station at some point, which will make for a very, very busy station. And I'm guessing the MTA portion of the station will absolutely be the ones that are providing the most passengers versus um, Amtrak or New Jersey Transit. So, um, if you have a chance to look, Lisa, do we have the presentation that we can send to folks? There's a link on the MTA's website. I can put oh, the okay. link well, in the we'll chat. We'll send the link. We'll send you the link. You have to see this. Um, it is yeah. it is quite startling. One of um, one of the one of the one of the uh, interesting um, pieces of information that was uh, in the slide deck yesterday was actually that even though the numbers of people 
on the uh, New York um, commuter, uh, you know, Metro North and Long Island Railroad commuter trains will, will uh, increase um, between now and 2038, our anticipated increase. The percentage of riders going into Penn Station will actually decrease um, a lot uh, as New York, as New Jersey Transit and Amtrak numbers increase. And uh, the Amtrak numbers will also, the percentage will decrease because of Moynihan will absorb a lot of that. So they're anticipating that more and more Long Island Railroad um, folks will go over to um, uh, over to Grand Central. M much more to be learned. There's an opportunity for comment too, but I will get, um, yes, yes, Andy, he was. I will, I will get the link into the chat. And uh, Jano did not mention this yesterday, but um, there are plans for increased Amtrak service into the station as well in the corridor. Um, there are new Acela train sets that are being obtained and will be put into use in this year. And uh, they are faster and uh, it's, it's anticipated that there will be additional service on the Northeast Corridor, which is one of the issues about getting the Pelham Bridge rebuilt uh, prior to this increase in service, because it will be hard to, uh, to take that bridge out of service um, once, once you have this level. So that was very interesting. Um, whether we will live to see this new state. I hope we will, many of you will. Um, on the central business tolling update, um, this, the traffic mobility review panel has not yet been selected, uh, but um, there have been informational sessions given to, board, to the board about where the sensors will be placed. Um, there was some, obviously it is between 60 and 61st street on uh, island-wide on, on, in Manhattan. Um, if obviously you've all heard if you stay on the FDR and or West Side Highway and don't go onto the city streets, you won't receive the congestion charge. Um, there have been some questions and the technology in this does exist so that if you were, for instance, going through the- The evaluation the Hugh Carey Tunnel, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, and your destination was the Holland Tunnel, and you had to be on city streets for a little, a block or two before you actually entered the tunnel, you could get credit for having was there. taken the toll, the, the, uh, the congestion fee, gone on the city streets, and then since you were going right into the tunnel, the toll would be, um, the congestion fee would be reversed. So they have that technology. It isn't clear that they're gonna do that yet, but, um, St stay clear. Uh, we, we hope to hear about this. Um, Lisa has called um, in her testimony yesterday that all these um, discussions about the mobility, who will be exempt, who won't be exempt, um, must, be, must be absolutely done in the sunshine. Everybody has to hear these deliberations and, and be able to ask questions. There will be public hearings, obviously. Um, but it isn't clear yet when the group was going to be chosen. Um, vehicles would be told once daily. So that means if you entered the congestion zone and left and came back, you would still be charged just once. Um, obviously emergency vehicles and vehicles transporting people with disabilities are going to be exempt, but it is not clear who else will be exempt. Um, many New Jersey politicians obviously are screaming about having to pay the high port authority tolls and then be hit with the congestion charge. Will they get credit towards that charge? Um, will, it, will they have no additional congestion fee? It isn't clear. Um, and apparently the George Washington Bridge will be treated differently than the Lincoln and Holland tunnels. So stay tuned for that debate. Um, there is a lot of talk about who pays what and who gets exempt. Um, I see somebody with a hand up. Um, uh, with a one six nine one. Um, who it's is Christopher. that? Oh, Christopher. Did you want to ask a question now, Chris? Yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm on the phone. Yeah, Andrew. The one thing I just wanted to ask: the, uh, when you mentioned about, I saw the presentation yesterday. I was very pleased with Rhino about getting the um, seeing what they're doing at Penn Station. I see more accessibility added in. He did mention that yesterday in the meeting. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. And I am very happy about that because 
and stay in hearing about the West Pet Hunt Center, Hunting Line, as well as the Woodhaven. I definitely support that all the way. So please let me know what can I do at this time. I will definitely. And uh, there is no question that all of these Penn Station improvements would be accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, the entire station will yeah, be accessible. Yeah. That's, that's a no-brainer, Chris. Uh, um, well, I definitely know, but I just want to make this really clear for the record that I want to support this. But I guess you please let me know how can I help you with that. Okay, I will. Thank you. Um, so the mail and ride program uh, on the Long Island Railroad is being migrated to the electronic, um, to the to the, you know to the um, to the e to the east uh, ticket um, services and electronic uh, payment, especially when Omni comes. But um, the people using mail and ride have been declining over the years, ever almost. Almost everybody's using the mobile apps now. And so that is what the Long Island Railroad is gearing everybody towards. And it will be phased out, um, which will also mean the end of paper tickets since everybody's using uh, their phones uh, or mobile devices or whatever to pay um, lately. And you will it will be a, a financial incentive to do so as well. So um, watch for that migration um, to happen. Um, Within the next few months, I'm guessing, it will be phased out. Uh, also, most people, snail mail has, has become unreliable uh, to a certain degree. So tickets by mail are a thing of the past and probably rightly so. Um, so something very exciting happened and um, Lisa was out there representing the Long Island Railroad Commuter Council, but uh, President Eng of the Long Island Railroad held a press conference in Oyster Bay a couple of days ago, um, and they will be testing battery powered M7 trains so that people who live in diesel territory will have a one seat ride to their New York, to their city destinations, be it Atlantic Terminal or Penn Station, rather than having to change trains uh, from a diesel to an electric. Um, this has lots of implications um, for increased ridership, increased service. Um, Lisa, as you were at the press conference, did you want to say anything about it? Yeah, it was, uh, it was very exciting. There was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of buzz surrounding uh, this possibility. It would be the uh, Long Island Railroad would be the first uh, in, the, in North America to, to try technology that's already happening in Europe. Um, and Metro North is hopefully not far behind. The first test is an eight month uh, trial um, off road as it were, um, and that if it proves successful, that they will uh, that they'll then do it on two unpassengered uh, M7 cars on the Oyster Bay line to see how long battery life is, how it operates under um, specific you know, uh, track conditions, um, in, including weather and then they'll expand the test. The thought is to try it on the Oyster Bay line because it's 13 miles uh, and they would be able to charge it at either, either end of the station, uh, either, end of the, um, either end of the line. And that uh, there is a possibility of using these BMUs or the battery trains uh, in lieu of uh, electrifying um, entire lines like Port Jefferson, which if you read some of the um, trade um, publications and authors, there is some back and forth as to whether it's uh, a good idea or a bad idea. But the idea right now is that um, it's it's an opportunity to see uh, ways to make the fleet more um, flexible, to uh, add service essentially um, by making um, by being able to give some people well, improve service, I should say, by giving people now who don't have it a one seat ride where they otherwise might not. Um, and by giving like on Port Jefferson, on the Port Jefferson line, for example, during the heat of the summer, they may take a whole bunch of cars off of that line and put them on the South shore to accommodate the Montauk line and the Fire Island trains and the Hampton trains. So there might be some trains with three cars in the contest. So um, they would then be able to divert um, cars and make them so that those those Port Jefferson line trains were whole. There are no Fire Island trains, to be exact. Well, to the Fire Island ferries. Actually, there yeah, that's true. Yes. No, because Robert Moses had, did not have his way. No, exactly. Not exactly. The key, the key to this 
experiment will be how long the batteries are good for, if they can be charged en route, and if they will work on a three hour trip, which a train to Montauk is or longer, or, and a train to Greenport versus, you know, an hour, an hour and 45 to two on Port Jeff and, you know, maybe just a little over an hour to, to Oyster Bay. So they are different animals, obviously, uh, but we certainly, I did ask President Eng if this technology will be usable on M9s because we will be getting M9s from Kawasaki when, when they are back in full production and they are beautiful cars, anyone who's ridden them. And he said they should be transferable. Um, this project is being done by Alstom. Alstom is very familiar with the M7s, obviously, but it is Kawasaki who's building the M9s. But I think they will, should be they should be usable. And obviously this technology would be transferable to Metro North as well, uh, which means that electric, electric route, the electric trains wouldn't have to end at Croton Harmon or White Plains North. You could continue up to Wasaic, for instance, all on a one seat ride, which should make Sharon very happy. But, um, but the also, uh, the, um, the other um, alternative, um, the other, um, boy, you just, I just was, thinking something and then as soon as Sharon got happy that went out of my mind <laughs> uh, can, this is Trudy can you see when I when I raise my hand no you have to push a button on your phone I yeah. am I am and I didn't want to interrupt but when you called on Chris and uh, so I don't want to interrupt but at the same time I did have two Two things to say to Andrew's report, Andrew. If I, I'll wait until you're finished. If, if you I'm, want, I'm pretty much. Uh, I just want to do the transit portion, and then I'll be done. I okay. Remember, then can you call on me first when you're through? Not I don't a want problem. To interrupt. I did remember you. my. I did remember my point, which was okay, that they will not going forward that the that they'll be able to order cars with the um, the dual modes already incorporated. That they would not need to be retrofitted. So that that's. That would save them money and time in the end. Battery power, dual mode. Yeah. 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 Oh, that would be wonderful. Um, so um, under the transit report, um, ridership is continuing up. On uh, April 20th, we hit 2,449,000 riders uh, in one day, which is, which is great news. Um, they are continuing to work to reduce overtime. Uh, um, now that the capital plan is has resumed, basically, um, CBTC installation is resuming uh, on Queens Boulevard West and um, all the way down to 47th, 50th on the 6th Avenue route and 50th and 8th on the 8th Avenue route. Uh, work continues on the Culver Line uh, in Brooklyn. And uh, I'm, I'm guessing there will be an announcement on the 8th Avenue line uh, before too long now. Um, there will have to be some, definitely some GOs when that happens. Um, so it was important that they finished the uh, Rutgers tube work, which they have. So um, this may mean that trains, 8th Avenue line trains would get rerouted to the Rutgers tube, much as the Rutgers tube trains, you know, the 6th Avenue line were rerouted to the 8th Avenue. Uh, we're very lucky that the 6th and 8th Avenue lines are, uh, <laughs> they meet in both, uh, you know, you can reroute very easily between J Street and West 4th Street. So that, that was really great that our builders thought of that. Um, pretty much uh, that's it for the transit report. So Trudy, you had a question or a comment. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you. And did you see that I, that I raised my hand? We still don't see it. Are you hitting star? Okay, then Andrew, star that's something, something that you're going to have when you when you give me my lesson, my tutorial. We'll find out why that isn't working. Also, anyway, okay. two things. First of all, you you mentioned about uh, uh, the transit chief and Sarah getting into it. I just want to, I, for those who didn't uh, monitor the board meeting like I tried to do, uh, I want to congratulate you for your statement about that the public does not pay attention to statistics, but what they know about, what they hear about 
crime on the subways and the, the numbers don't mean anything to them. It's an old line that I learned from a great PR person who said the facts are irrelevant. It's the perception that counts. And that's really the problem. But you have you. You said it even better than I'm saying it now. So for those who don't know, I just want to really congratulate you for the way you you took it on and and what you said. That's number one. Number two, on the congestion pricing, I have it on good authority that that is something that is on the uh, Secretary, I still call him Mayor Pete, but anyway, Secretary Buttigieg's agenda because they want to push it through as soon as possible because it really doesn't cost the feds money but it will be bringing in a lot of money at least that's the way it was um communicated to me so anything that maybe we should send another i don't know a a communication or or just push on on um uh, new york city transit to push to help them in pushing it along because they they really want to do it and they really want to get the um they were the study done and the report done and really get it moving so um despite what the new jersey people are trying to do to block it it's an interesting situation they are really out there um and i understand their their issue um and can i can i I just want to um so trudy um trudy and others I've been having some conversations with folks who've been working on the project uh, and offered our assistance in any possible way that we can, including with outreach. Um, And they are moving along at a very good pace um, and having high level meetings. So uh, my understanding um, is that they're uh, internally very pleased with how things are going, almost giddy, um, especially compared to how things were a year ago. Um, well, and yeah. um, plus we've got know, the environmental assessment versus the environmental impact statement. Right. And, and they um, and because they had been making such good progress on the EA already, you know, there's some work that um, city DOT needs to do. Um, and city DOT knows that they, that they're, and they're, they're moving forward on that as well. So well, my, Lisa, my, I'm trying. Yes. Okay. Finish. Uh, Go ahead, no, what I was going to say is that I was going, the people that I've been talking to say that another little push from us couldn't hurt because there are people, mainly the, on the I'm talking now on the federal level, not, not locally here, not anything else, that there is because of the <laughs> squabble that the New Jersey delegation in Congress and and people, New Jersey people are doing, that it would not hurt for us to do another nudge or to indicate in writing or something how important it is that this move along as quickly and any problems that still exist, but that should not hold it up because the New Jersey um, squabble, whatever you want to call it, is holding it up. So you so is so, this something I mean, that I'm we should be? I'm just trying to share some information that right, I have. But should this go to Secretary Buttigieg? Yes, it should. Well, or we can, we can go. Yeah. Or we can go. Well, the best thing is not not even to go through Polly, though Polly would appreciate it also. But um, uh, that go, and we also have somebody else there. Oh my God, my mind just blanked out as I was talking. Nuria, but the new head of the FTA. Yeah, um, Nuria Fernandez. Nuria who is one of Nuria Nuria is is been named head of the FTA and so we have good people down there helping us but we need to help them along also so that they can help us so I, I, I yeah I think probably a letter direct to uh secretary Pete would be the best thing to do that's just I, my my that's my own opinion I, I don't know you may want it's to like it's like them. chicken soup it couldn't hurt exactly I just want to I just want to add that any exemptions, like uh, including those that the um, New Jersey politicians are, are calling for for the George Washington Bridge, need to go through TMRB. So any letter that we write, we would need to call for the MTA to appoint the members of TMRB and to hold their meetings in public. So it would be a, a, 
a letter that would include both of those things. I'm not so, going into the technicalities. A very short letter just saying how important this is to us and that the funding coming in from it will be so helpful and that it won't cost the feds anything. It's and you're uh, not going into all of the uh, down in the weeds and not going uh, this. That's just my advice. A very short but concise letter. Just again, emphasizing well, how you. important this I is. Think we, I think we can do it. Yeah, that's OK. Um, oh, and then I mentioned about the uh, about the FTA. Uh, anything else on a uh, on a, a federal level? I'll leave until later. Uh, to discuss and some things right. on a state level too. I don't want to take more time because some of our people think I talk too much, which I do. <laughs> uh, Chris's hand is up again. Chris? Yes, I'm here. Um, I just wanted to ask that question, but Trudy mentioned it. I'm glad she did because I actually agree with her. But the question is also... Um, the other question is more important is, did I hear correctly, you said the West Hudson, Hudson, as well as the regular Hudson, and um, those two lines will be also coming to Penn Station? Um, yes, the Hudson line of Metro North will eventually mm -hmm. be coming into Penn Station. Um, mm -hmm. And there are several um, Manhattan, Harlem yeah. area politicians that would love to see a 125th Street stop on that line, I might add which would be great for lots of people. And uh, then the west of Hudson are, is supposed to get connected um, don't, by, a, by a loop in Secaucus, which is, which is not a big deal, uh, which hopefully they will build. And then that will also come into Penn Station. I will be very happy for that because I used to take the west Hudson train because my other cousin who lives in Pennsylvania, always had to pick us up at the last stop at Port, Jer uh, Port Jefferson. I can't even say it with a V. But I would be really, really happy for that, on that as well. Thank Port Jervis. You. you mean Port Jervis, not Port Jefferson. Yeah, no, it's going to be great when that happens, no doubt about it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lisa, I think uh, we're ready for your report at this point. Um, sure, great. So we, um, you know, one of the issues that we have been working on uh, has been wage works, pre-tax benefit dollars, pre-tax yeah. pre transit benefit dollars. Um, and it's something that the chair of the Long Island Railroad Commuter Council, Jerry Bringman, has been raising for a year now. People who have money in their uh, wage works or transit check funds and haven't been able to access them because they're not commuting. They may not in, expect to commute, to commute again. Um, and they would like to access those funds for a variety of other reasons. And there is no mechanism for the IRS uh, or Treasury Department to refund those their money. There is um, There have been some articles in the papers over the past year, including one from last April about problems that um, a little bit of a runaround that that um, the companies that run the programs were giving people, um, and an article not too long ago in the New York Times that we helped to shepherd through, um, and a lot of legwork um, that the Long Island Road Commuter Council actually uh, did to to bring forward some customers who have been who've got thousands of uh, you know a thousand dollars here or eight hundred dollars there, and our Metro North Commuter Council riders as well have some. Um, hefty sums that are tied up in these accounts. So we wrote a letter uh, last, uh, on April 15th, a fitting day to the IRS uh, asking for, uh, to the IRS and to the Treasury Secretary, asking uh, that they um, find, a, 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 find it in their hearts, but find a, a, a mechanism, a regulatory mechanism for a once um, a one-shot amnesty or some kind of arrangement, do a 1099 deal, whatever it takes to allow people to either take money out of their accounts um, now uh, and pay taxes on them or to be able to, um, to have some flexibility with that, with those funds. So you, may, you may or may not know if you lose your job, you lose those dollars also. 
So going forward, hopefully to uh, find a way to have those dollars travel with you since they are actually your dollars. Uh, we've been um, reaching out to uh, elected officials who've written on uh, written letters also to the IRS and Treasury um, for their help and gotten some initial enthusiastic responses and then that just sort of went quiet. Uh, and I spoke to Senator Schumer's office this week and they are um, working hard to, um, to find a way to uh, make some changes and to, and, to, and to get some resolution here. So um, I'm, I'm more optimistic than I was. Uh, one of the things that, they, that their staff said to me was the IRS doesn't seem to understand how this could even be a problem. Why didn't people just stop putting money in as soon as this, as the pandemic hit. It's like, well, that, you know, we, people had no idea that a year later we'd still be sitting here, right? There, um, and in two months, that's already $540 at least. So uh, I sent them um, a lot of supporting material and I'm going to follow up with them and need to do some additional research. We also shared our, um, due to your crackling and crunching, um, shared shared some additional. Um, we we sent the we we sent copies of the letter, which was signed off on by seventeen organizations, uh, to our senators in New Jersey and Connecticut as well. Um, and uh, you know, Senator Gillibrand's office is also interested. So ho hopefully, we'll find some resolution on that. And that's been um, after being exciting, then not exciting, then exciting, then not exciting. Hopefully we'll, we'll get some movement on what is a national issue, but that affects people more in urban areas. So if any of you have experienced that issue, please do let me know too. And what was the response from Senator Schumer's office? They said that it was very helpful that we shared, that I shared the information that we have with them um, be, as they're trying to work with uh, monolithic agencies that don't understand why yeah. it's, it's a big deal. Um, uh, that you know they they've asked me to find out you know how how many people might be affected and how many dollars could be at stake. Um, you know the New York Times reporter we worked with wasn't able to find out how many people were affected and how many dollars were at stake, but we'll do what we can. Um, there you know there there the more people pay attention to this. Um, through the news media, through national news media, through national elected officials, the more of an impact I think we're going to have. So our ultimate goal, um, aside from fixing all of this, is to hopefully get a you know, Sunday press conference with Senator Chuck um, to really draw attention to, um, to this because he does, he's, he's, he's a macher and he's got the ability to get things done. Yes, Stuart, I said it. <laughs> Um, so, you know, they were appreciative a, of it. And a, I'm big gonna, macher, a big macher. A big macher, yes. Um, or Stuart, as my husband she's bilingual, say, see? Right. A good macher. Um, a, so we'll um, be able to, you know, hopefully we'll get some, some movement. And, and I'll follow up with them um, in the coming week or weeks with whatever we can uh, also find out. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up with uh, finding out how long... Transcore, the company that's going to build the readers for congestion pricing, expects it to take for the installation from river to river. I think that's an important thing for us to know. I will get that. Yes. Um, um, the the, other, I, I, I was, I'll, I'll, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I apologize. Uh, I was just saying, um, for those that don't know, um, tomorrow is Al Putre's last day at the MTA. He is the father of Omni, as you may recall. Um, I'm hoping that maybe he'll be able to join us at some point today so we can give him a hearty thank you. Uh, he will not fade away. Um, he is reachable. And uh, the person who will be in charge of Omni, Wayne Lydon, uh, is well aware that we exist and, and how we feel about the program and what we think it needs to be able to do moving forward. And so we will definitely have Wayne as a speaker um, once he's gotten his his feet wet as, as the chief Omni uh, person, but um, the program is continuing for sure. And later this year, there should be an MTA issued Omni card. And, Andrew, and, will, will uh, the new person- Sorry? 
I'm sorry. Will the new person continue the Omni Time mantra that Al started? I'm guessing he will. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. But we've had Wayne at our meetings before as well. Yeah. So I don't think he would have gotten the job if he hadn't been able to say. Yeah, I'm guessing. Good. I'm guessing that also. Right. Uh, Chris, another question. <laughs> I'm not going to be rude. I'm going to raise my hand. That's the one thing that Mr. Jackie told us. Um, I know Wayne very well as well. And, he, and I did ask him that question at the ACT meeting. He said he would get back to me. But I told him that you got, if you're going to wear his shoes, you got to say, guess what time it is. And he's got to do it or get out to record it and make that announcement because that is the most, every, everyone I know loves when he does it. Yeah, it's it's a catchy type. It's a catchy slogan. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. It's like now we got to do you, Andrew. That's your time in the Andrew, Andrew Albert time. Yeah, right. Lisa, were you done yeah, with your yeah. report yet? Because um, uh, I, I wanted to. There were, there were two more items. Um, okay, that I please just go on. To get up on. Um, we are continuing to work with our, our our local and our national advocacy partners in advocacy, and. What we're focusing on now, um, well, today's Earth Day, as we've all, as we've all wished each other a happy Earth Day. Um, but um, as one, of, we are looking sort of at the big picture of transit in the scheme of transit as transportation reauthorization legislation, um, and working uh, on both the local and national levels um, on a on a platform of ensuring that transit gets sufficiently funded so that uh, it includes operating money, that it includes, um, a, a, that it's reflective of, without pitting urban centers against rural centers, because we do not want um, to have anybody uh, vote against it, um, but to, to be reflective, more reflective of ridership um, as a percentage. Um, as opposed to the formula as it currently exists, um, that there be an understanding of uh, how transit provides, transit is a more equitable source of, of transportation and the climate goals uh, as well. So we are, um, you know, continuing uh, to work on that level and, and sent, uh, recently sent a letter, signed on to a letter that other groups locally as part of a national effort um, have signed on to in support of, of those of those goals. So we there we are there. Um, and uh, we um, so that's really two of those major efforts. We've we had um, I'm gonna turn it over to Bradley who will give Before you Before you do, I just yeah. wanna say um, something that I neglected to say, which was there is a zoning text amendment um, known as zoning for transit accessibility yes. that will be presented to all cities, all of the city's 59 community boards uh, for a passage, uh, hopeful passage. Um, last night it was presented to my community board, zoning for transit accessibility gives developers a bonus um, for providing uh, either elevator access or an easement in their building for subway access. Um, the bonus varies uh, depending on which of those two things they get, how far they are from the subway, whether there are other, what, what the zoning already grants them for bonuses. This got into a, quite a discussion at last night's um, Community Board 7 Land Use Committee. And um, there is some hesitancy on that community board because of additional bulk that this might mean. Um, but pretty much everybody expressed the hope that every station would become accessible. And I, I explained to them that this was by no means the only source of funding for accessibility, obviously with congestion pricing coming and 11 billion uh, a year towards the 55 billion MTA capital program, which provides for pretty much a lot of accessible stations. That was also coming. But uh, if, if this allowed a developer who was uh, building a new building to incorporate an entrance or a stairway or build an elevator, um, that so much the better. And I really hope that it does get passed. Um, there are some points in this legislation where 
it does not have to go through the local community board. And that was troubling to, needless to say, to our community board, I'm sure to others. Um, when they showed the brochure of this plan, it was an amazing map which showed every transit station, including commuter rail in the five boroughs. It showed the entire Staten Island Railway. It showed the Long Island Railroad. It even showed air train, believe it or not. I mean, this had every single station. I was very impressed with the map. So I asked, does this mean that this program is workable on commuter rail stations as well? And they said it was. So this zoning for transit accessibility is, is going to be a citywide program if it's passed. Uh, and um, it holds great promise for making more stations accessible and for incorporating easements into new buildings uh, where transit access is not so, so easily and better than digging into a, a, an existing sidewalk or something if you have a new building going in. So it's an exciting program. Uh, we will see where it goes. I'm sure every each of the 59 community boards will probably have 59 different opinions, but um, I have a feeling it's it's going to meet largely with approval pending certain certain changes, perhaps. Um, so just um, be aware of that. So um, Bradley and I, and I know Mike was on that call, and some other folks here uh, may have been on it as well. We're on we're on a call this morning um, as well. Uh, look at an update on that. Um, and we had actually had a, a sort of a light presentation here a few months back. Um, maybe we can get an update in, in a few months to, as it moves closer toward, um, as we move closer toward the summer, because that's when it will moves closer toward the next steps. And now that um, our guest speaker actually has come, he's put some some of his own touches uh, on in, into the into the plan, and I think that that's only gotten better for us. And you know um, what? The, one of the illustrations they showed uh, that city planning presented was the station at 51st and 53rd and Lexington. And on the, on the slide, it showed the E, the V and the six. I said, you're gonna to wanna to update that slide. <laughs> well, it also, e, and six. <laughs> the presentation today talked about 493 stations. And I that almost- was, That's it. because that includes the Staten Island Railway. Okay. It's 472 plus the Staten Island Railway station. So it is that number. Okay. Just so you know, everything old is new again, because this was a pro program that was started with Rone Menchel and Dick Ravage way oh, back yeah. in the old days when I was there. And that's how 51st and Lex, the extra entrances, and especially at Hunter College, the Hunter College station, which, which made an extra entrance, oh, yeah. 68th and Lex. So it was done a long time ago. And it's just, you know, everything, as I said, everything old is is new again and if i may quickly just add one thing on to lisa your federal report which is that officially or unofficially with the 1.9 trillion dollar infrastructure program uh transportation is taking the lead on that through secretary pete and he in every one of his appearances on he was on um oh, it was CNN this morning and over the weekend, whatever, keeps on talking about how transportation is, is the biggest part of this infrastructure thing. And then now it is also considered part of the big climate program. So, uh, you know, we, we're doing really good with the feds. And uh, I think that bodes well for yeah. all of us. Indeed, thank you. Chris, another one? Well, Andrew, you're going to mention about accessibility. I'm going to mention that uh, at, I was at that press conference on Good Friday with um, with the chair, head chairperson Jessica Murphy from uh, ACTA, and we definitely were very pleased with this because we, do, we definitely need to do this. It will make it easier for the business. It will make it easier for the accessibility, so not just the disabilities, but the seniors as well. Because as I'm in the area doing mass work, a lot of people are saying they can't wait to do this because stations that are, don't have accessibility in the area, uh, parts of South Brooklyn, we need it really much because a person, a person cannot really get up here. They have to go all the way to Coney Island if you want to, if you're near Coney Island, go to King's Highway on the Q and B, Bay Park on the B, or 86th Street in Bay Ridge. They need more options. 
and and I and I just let you guys know, Lisa, I was here this morning, uh, yesterday, but, uh, I did I did not have to put any questions, but I found out that they're supposed to be attending a lot of the Brooklyn Community Boards next month, so we'll hope to see that coming up. Chris, I hear the door is yes, closing. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm on the training. I'm actually trying to make sure I don't lose signal. So well, I'm be a good, I'm be a good neighbor. Don't talk too much. <laughs> be nice, Andrew. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we're ready for um, Bradley's uh, updated freedom ticket report. Yes. Which, um, which is very exciting. Yes, Brad we're very we're very excited. <laughs> I'm very excited to finally be at the, the final stretches. Um, so basically, I'm kind of in the last few hours of wrapping up the preliminary report. Um, next week, we are going to start our outreach with the MTA and its operating agencies, as we always do with our reports. Uh, we basically want to hear their uh, thoughts and concerns on how to e either make it better uh, or things that we meet, need to scale back on, like what we did in the original uh, freedom ticket plan in 2015-16. Um, so once we get those meetings arranged, hopefully they happen sooner than later um, so we can get this thing out the door because um, we've been waiting for quite some time to put this out. Um, but once we do that, uh, we can finalize the report, incorporate their concerns. And then at that point, since this does not only affect this council, but our other councils as well, we can present uh, the final report to the entire group. And then we will start our outreach efforts with elected officials, the public, and do a public launch and kind of get this thing going and hopefully build a strong coalition behind it and uh, get it moving. There's a lot of talk at the MTA board of restructuring fares and providing fair discounts. So this and is- getting people back on board, exactly. which this will certainly help. Exactly, so we, we, we drive those points in the report and really focus on faster travel options and providing with people with more options. Um, and it, it's all in the report, you guys will see it, and we look forward to your comments when we get that done. But again, we've got to go to the MTA first, get their comments, and then finalize everything, and then we'll turn it over to the group and get your comments as well. So we're really excited about it. My Did lights, lights just go off. out Yeah, there? it does every 20 minutes. <laughs> oh yeah, as soon as you move around, it comes back. Well, and that's the thing, Ellen's desk where she used to sit was the, the trigger point and so the, now there's nobody there um, oh, for gosh. obvious reasons and so yeah. I have to get up every now and then to turn it back on. Oh, you have to funny. get up and flap your arms around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the report is fabulous. Um, when we distribute it to, to all of you, you will see uh, such a fabulous report and I think it's definitely ready for prime time and I think the time to launch is, is probably ripe now with the need to get riders back on board and to present new options for people, um, especially if, um, and uh, you're gonna hear about this um, when we get the next Omni update, but Omni may actually end up doing away with seven and 30 day uh, ride passes because not only are people not necessarily traveling that way, but fare capping would be, um, you pay for a certain period of time and it ends at another period of time and anything over a certain number of trips is free. So uh, it may actually be much better for riders because it reflects the way you travel and it will in give incentive to have discretionary trips because the more you travel over a certain number of trips, they're all free. So um, stay tuned okay. for that. Uh, Andrew, I have a I Andrew, I have a question. Yeah, Stuart. Uh, for Bradley. So will our report reference the world of Omni? Yes. Oh. Yeah, we we do talk about Omni in that, um, and the the fact that it will help make the fare structure much easier, and you can provide discounts um, such as this, um, and that's one of the recommendations that we have in there. It speaks to Omni, and we want to get the the um, MTA and the railroads perspective on on those particular recommendations. So then I turn it back to Andrew. Then, so do we support what they're proposing? Uh, by eliminating those other tiers? I mean, do you... Do um, I need just, to see the real we, fine discuss, details of fare capping first. Yeah, because we discussed this at a prior meeting when they, when Al Putre sort of hinted at that. Yes. And I think we need to take a position once we get those finer details. But if they're not going to be in before the report gets out, I think we should, as Bradley says, just talk about it in a 
general way, you know, that yes. Mm-hmm. And, and we reserve our rights, obviously, uh, to comment once we see what they're proposing, uh, what replaces seven and 30 day passes. Um, you know, if people are reluctant to buy monthly and weekly because they're traveling two or three days a week now, and this gives you more incentive to use this system, let's see. I guess I'm biased. I use the 30 day, so. <laughs> we, but we don't go into that level of specificity. We don't, um, no. but But when we do talk about, you know, if, if there is uh, another, opportunity to comment before um, fair um, hike discussions, then absolutely those conversations would take place. Um, right. I, about, I, yeah, that's- I thought that's that we don't we, go into that specificity, yeah. but I just wanted to see that we embrace or, or that what we're thinking in terms of discounts can be um, uh, embraced with the new technology. Yeah, exactly. Dr. Andrews already had that conversation with them at, at the- at the nudging of at the nudging of many. Thank you. Absolutely. And we have been joined by our guests. Um, Wonderful. So, um, excuse, I'm sorry. Chris has his hand raised. Quickly. Okay, Chris. No, I pressed the wrong button, but there is a question that I agree with Stuart because the 30-day pass and the seven-day pass give for the disability and seniors. Do use that card for the reduced sales. So I see that still forgetting about the reduced sales provision. No, we're aware of that. Absolutely. Yep. No, we're not. We're not talking about. We are. We're, we're, we're not talking about senior and disabled fares. Those will be continued under Omni. I've been told. Yeah, we're, we're not. We're that 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 whole conversation okay. about the about the time based passes and that's a larger conversation. Absolutely. For us to have and fair care. Okay, so let's go to our featured guest. Um, for the first time ever, the MTA has a chief of system wide accessibility. He is Cromel Arroyo, uh, colloquially known as Q. Um, he's certainly a wonderful guy, and the system obviously, uh, the commuter rails obviously could use a lot more accessibility, not to mention all of the two thirds of the subway system that isn't accessible yet. Um, obviously our, our colleague uh, Edith was, was a big fighter for this and, um, and, and highlighted the, the distance between the trains and the platforms on, on commuter rail um, to us many times and, uh, and where the humps are and where they don't line up with certain car types and everything. And we have an absolute expert in queue uh, in the system now, and Q will be addressing all of these issues on a system-wide basis, transit, Metro North, and Long Island Railroad. So Q, welcome to the Transit Riders Council. Thank you so much, Andrew. It, it is a pleasure to be with you all. And thank you, Lisa, for having me. Uh, um, I see we're queuing up the presentation. Thank you all so much. No uh, pun intended. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, Andrew, you know, I, I, I'd like to start by, by you know, echoing your, your words on, on Edith, I, I know she was a strong voice in this community, uh, and not only at the PCAC, but, you know, in the disability conversation throughout the city, um, she really brought a lot of uh, uh, fire to the discussion and reminded us in government who it is that we serve, and, and specifically the people that we omit. Uh, uh, um, by design, because, you know, design is intentional. A- a- and whether you're an engineer, an architect, a, a planner, or, or, you know, a- another a government official like myself, we-, we-, we are in dire need to be reminded of, of who our-, our clients are, who it is that we're providing a service for. A- and that demographic is just so broad. And we often forget that. A- and it was something that Edith was a huge, huge advocate for reminding me uh, as a personal friend, we both live here, live. She, she also lived here in Washington Heights with me in Harlem. And it's just, you know, there's a big void, not only at the PCAC, the disability community at large, and, and, and a mentor and friend for me. Uh, um, so thank you for, for remembering her. And let's, you know, let, let's honor her. Thank you her for life. saying that. And let, of course, and, and let's honor her by continuing the effort. 
and, and, and that's what I'm excited to do here at the MTA. Uh, um, hi to, to, to those of you who know me. Hello to those of you who haven't met me yet. Uh, uh, some of you might know that I am not new to th this conversation. Having served as the Chief Accessibility Specialist at New York City DOT for Poly Trottenberg for just under six years uh, uh, before going to the private sector. So it's really exciting for me to be back. And what a statement the MTA has made with hiring me to really build on the successes that we saw from the system-wide accessibility team at Transit, but to go beyond that. And, and, and to get us started, you know, we'll go on to the, to the next slide. Uh, um, I know a lot of you are asking, you know, what does my position look like and how does it differ from, from what you saw at New York City Transit in the previous years? So, so I do not work for Transit, I, I work for the MTA. And it's a very opportune time for me to come to the MTA where we're all working to build a one MTA. My job as the chief accessibility officer is to really oversee all the different organizations and bring together, weave together a narrative of accessibility that's inclusive of all of New York City Transit, the Metro North, the Long Island Railroad and bridges and tunnel to the extent that we have pedestrian paths on those bridges. Uh, um, so, so it is super exciting for me to be here and, and carry the torch, again, building on the successes that we had seen before. We have a packed agenda for today. So we're going to the next slide. And please let me know if I'm going too fast for any of y'all, but we have a lot to cover. There's been a lot of great work happening here, Andrew, as you know, and, and I hope to shed some light onto the, the accessibility work that's been going on. Uh, um, next slide. So, Thank so, you. So, Can I tell you one thing? Absolutely. On your first slide? Yeah. Um, railroad is two words for the Long Island, even though it's not for Metro North. So you might want to change that. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, a lot of folks have been asking, a lot of uh, uh, you all from, from our catch up earlier have been thinking, what's going on with the capital plan? And Andrew, you know this more than any of us, but, but there's a lot of unknown in the capital plan right now. The capital plan that we thought we had in place is not what we have in place today. And, and we aren't sure where we're, where we're landing. We're in active conversations with our, our counterparts in the state and talking to my former boss and others in the federal level to really understand what it is that we have, what does the pot look like, to see if we can move forward with the very aggressive capital plan that we had set out for ourselves earmarking $5 billion for accessibility, the largest commitment ever seen before from the MTA. So, so more to come on that. Congestion pricing is moving forward and about a third of the, the monies that we thought we would have for this plan was coming from congestion pricing. So we're really excited to see those conversations progressing. It, it hasn't come to life yet. So, so more to come on that. Next slide. Now going into this exciting work that is going on right now, Accessibility you know, means many different things. And one of my first tasks when I got here was redefining accessibility at the MTA. You know, I am a person with a disability and, and like me, there's an estimated 1 million New Yorkers with disabilities. However, I know that the accessibility community is much broader than just that 1 million New Yorkers with disabilities. And it includes parents with strollers, seniors, with shopping carts, rolling walkers, a suite of mobility devices, and your average tourist coming out of JFK looking to access the air train and to get into our trains at Jamaica and, and so on. So, so we are enhancing how we define accessibility by testing out new wide fare gates, like you see on the screen right now, where we are actively uh, moving on a plan to install several of these wide fare gates throughout our system. I believe about four stations will see these wide fare gates and we're, we're testing them out. We'll look at fare evasions with these gates. We'll look at how they actually enhance accessibility for that long-term plan and vision to reimagine what the system looks like. Uh, you know, th that is one of the beauties of this role that I get to reimagine what accessibility looks like, not just today and tomorrow, but 20 years from now. And, and, and this is one of those ways that we're doing that. Next slide. There's a lot of work going on on elevator rehabilitation and accessibility options. And right now you see, we are finishing rehabilitations, uh, elevator rehabs that were previous from previous plans from the 2015, 2019 plan. We're enhancing stations such as Borough Hall, 
Franklin Avenue, an 11 elevator package starting this summer. I am so excited to see elevators at Bar Hall and really building on the accessibility that was existing there, making stations completely accessible and, and adding new ones to the map. We're looking at extensive rehab packages for elevators and escalators in the 2020-2024 plan. And already, despite a pandemic, you've seen us install elevator at 10 stations, 11 elevators uh, uh, um, faster than ever before. And, and, and we've set out to do even more despite not knowing what the financial situation will look like. We are moving forward with a very aggressive agenda to install elevators faster than ever before. Next slide. And Q, I think um, in, in procurements, we're, 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 we're putting more elevators together in each procurement so that each individual elevator costs less. So it's, we can do more. Exactly, Andrew. And, and, and you know, I have to say a lot of these enhancements, a lot of these awesome updates that I'm sharing from you would not be possible without the innovation from CND. You know, construction design is really packaging these pro these projects, these elevators in such a way that it is reducing costs for us. So we're going to get a lot more bang for our buck and, and, and kudos to them for sharing the responsibility of creating an accessible system and really understanding that what I tell everyone at, at the MTA, I am but the mere facilitator of this conversation. I rely on all other chiefs and everybody throughout the organization from the president to their staffers to really do the work and do the heavy lifting with me to really see accessibility be enhanced throughout the system. You've seen automated ADA station announcements on a lot of our trains already. When you get to West 4th, J Street, you hear announcements that tell you whether or not that elevator is working at that station in real time. And, and you hear the whereabouts of that elevator Awesome information. Access to information is access to independence. And that's what we're providing for our riders. Before they get out of their homes, at the stations and in the subway cars themselves, you're going to see a lot more on effective communication in the coming month from me. But, but these are things that you already see right here, right now. Um, we're going to go in depth at J Street Station Lab. Yes, we're, we're going to get to your questions, uh, uh, um, but, but I did see that. Um, let, let's dig deep in, into J Street and, and talk about some of those enhancements. Uh, uh, next slide. So at J Street, I, I don't know how many of y'all have been able to make it over to Brooklyn, but we've seen a lot of great things happening there. And, that, you know, that was just the inception. You've seen the evolution. This has been an iterative process with extensive feedback, not only from our staff who install and maintain a lot of these enhancements, but from our riders. And, and you've seen the evolution of these programs in the decals themselves, where on the left, you see what started out at J Street Metro Tech with a, a narrow guidance uh, pathways, explaining to people where the elevators uh, uh, were located and, and the routes that they were interested in. And then you saw a, an, an evolution of that uh, uh, at Grand Central, where you saw a more wider usage uh, of the, those decals and, and really showcasing that accessibility is for everyone, uh, um, the disability community and more. Uh, next slide. I am so thrilled. Just this, uh, uh, in, in the last week, we installed a new tactile map on 23rd Street uh, 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 on the Broadway line. And, and it really gives a lot of information to your low vision and blind rider so that they know the extent of the line, so that they know not only where they're going, but everything that lives in between. Because, you know, New Yorkers and New York happens in real time. And we want to give people information to move about in whatever fashion they want. Maybe they change their mind of their debt, where they're heading and what destination that they're coming to. And we want to provide that information to all the riders so that they know what's happening around them, where they're headed, and all the different options along that route. On the left-hand side, you see a tactile map on the R line that we installed in a platform. And, and on the right hand side, you're seeing an imagery uh, of that map that we just installed on 23rd Street. With these maps, we will be providing information on our website of their location so that low vision and blind uh, riders know exactly where they can go and feel them out uh, um, quite literally. Uh, um, next slide. There has, there's an absolutely fascinating change coming to our buses. Um, the, the SWA, the, the system-wide accessibility team 
has been working hard and communicating to our buses division what accessibility looks like and, and who that customer is and expanding the definition from beyond that person in a wheelchair and a mobility in, in, in that four wheel device. And, and we are now bringing in new buses to our systems that have more than just those accessible seats as we know them. We have, as you can see in, in the slide, we're presenting to, from the left to the right. On the far left, you are seeing a one seat flip up chair uh, uh, that can accommodate that accessible space. But beyond that, in the middle, and to the right, you see different iterations of those flip-ups, one seats, two seat flip-ups, and, and really three, seat, three bench flip seats next to single uh, uh, seats. And we're doing that because you have a lot of our aging communities who are, are relying on our buses, who, who may not want to ride the subway ever. And, and that spot for a person with a wheelchair might be taken reserved or, or could be best utilized by these single fl flip seats spaces for a person with a wheeled walking walker or, or a smaller accessibility device. Yes, ultimately we will be speaking about parents and strollers and, 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 and perhaps we get to a future where we have policies in place for parents to not to have to fold their strollers because we will have redesigned the fixed uh, design of buses to allow for additional spaces for a person in a wheelchair to be at a bus next to or behind a person with an open wheel device, a rolling walker or a stroller there. So really great work coming out of buses, reimagining the bus design, which hasn't happened in far too long. Next slide. There's a lot of agency-wide initiatives and I started off by saying how my job differs from what you saw in transit and it's that I get to look at best practices from one area of the house and weave it throughout the other areas of the house. And, and you'll hear uh, about some of those initiatives coming forward. Uh, um, next slide. For those of you who have not heard yet, we have a very exciting uh, project in the works called Elevate Transit Zoning for Accessibility. The first time ever that the MTA has collaborated with the city uh, department of city planning and the city council to change the zoning laws in New York City, to change the zoning envelope and extend the benefits that we've seen in Midtown and really bring it throughout the entire city so that anytime a developer, a private developer is building within the vicinity of a transit infrastructure, they get brought to the table for either A, an easement, so space in their building to connect to our property, or be a bonus that they, that they can get for installing an elevator and maintaining that elevator or other accessibility features. Uh, um, so, so really exciting things coming out of zoning for accessibility. Really, I am thrilled to see this type of innovation hit our streets because this is exactly what we need to get to full accessibility. On our own, New York will not see it happening as fast as it will when we bring other players to help us out. And, and the reality is that developers benefit, their tenants benefit when we have an accessible system abutting their properties. It, it's that much richer, it provides access for everyone that, that, that's living or working in these structures. And, and I'm really excited to see that the development community brought to the table. You know, uh, um, we would hope that this would happen on its own, but, but this is New York. There's a cost for doing, uh, for, for operating uh, um, in, in our streets, for work, you know, for my job at New York City DOT, I can tell you, it is extremely complex to do this work. Not only do we have a myriad uh, of subterranean uh, uh, underground infrastructure with gas, uh, electric, and other utilities, uh, broadband lines moving around, but we definitely need partnerships to install elevators to bring access to our transit systems. Next slide. Y'all have already seen and heard of Omni. I heard uh, as, as I joined the conversation, you were talking about Omni and you're absolutely right, Andrew. These programs that you were mentioning are not going to weigh with Omni, but Omni will create a one system for every rider. And, and, and that is an, an amazing thing for us. You know, we, we, we thought we had it right with MetroCard, but we saw that we could get even better than that. And as his party gift to us, Al Petre, who you all heard, Sarah Feinberg, and 
Pat, Pat talked about it yesterday, is retiring and leaving behind an absolutely awesome system called Omni. You've already seen Omni being rolled down in buses and a lot of our subways, and, and it will bring a one payment system, the first open loop system ever. And what that means is people will be able to pay using their smartphone, their smartwatch, their credit card, or their Omni card to access our system. You know, Omni has a lot of accessibility enhancements and, and, and will change the game to how the disability community and the community at large interacts with it. I always tell people like Al that, that you know, they, they really should have gone above and beyond where they, where they stopped that thinking of Omni. Omni provides so many services. I have a friend who doesn't have the use of her arms and, and she was never able to swipe a metric card. You know, Omni provides access for her and many other people. But specifically for the disability community, as we know, you'll see AutoGate uh, installations already on, on their way. We will be installing Omni readers at all our AutoGate cards. And, and the Reduce Fair program launch should be happening this summer in the fall. Paratransit will also see uh, uh, um, optimization with Omni, where the rider won't have to. Uh, um, have to be burdened with, with paying cash on these systems. The payment systems will happen behind the scenes seamlessly at, at Paratransit, huge enhancement there. And accessibility has been embedded in the validators, the app, the website, and the program experience in totality. So a lot of engagement with our active community, great interactions with, and recommendations. And we see a lot of their recommendation coming out to live in the rollouts that uh, this summer and in the fall. Next slide. So now to talk about the railroads, we, we, we saw, uh, I don't know how many of you saw me with Phil Ang and team uh, out talking about the updates that are, that are already existing in the Long Island Railroad app, where we are now showcasing from their phones to all the riders, the spatial information of every station so that people know the nearest elevator escalator from their subway cart. So now you know from each cart where you stand in proximity to the elevator or escalator that you're trying to get to. Beyond that, we've enhanced uh, uh, the Long Island Railroad apps for low vision and blind pedestrians, really providing high visibility maps and giving information to all those passengers. But my favorite piece of all of this enhancements that we've seen there is information about passenger load count not only because of COVID, more important than ever, it, it, we wanna know how crowded each car is, but we now provide that data in a Long Island Railroad. A, a, and one of the first things I, I, I did when I saw that was call Metro North. And, and I'm happy to report that the Metro North is now working with the Long Island Railroad team to introduce a lot of these enhancements to their own app and their ecosystems. In addition to those features, you might have heard of the Long Island Railroad help points, new uh, uh, phys uh, physical assets that are being installed along the Long Island Railroad that will flash lights to, to help conductors know where they may have a person with a disability that needs to board the, the, the train. And, and a lot of communications happening between the disability community, the passenger with disabilities, a conductor at each train through the Long Island Railroad Care app. And a lot of that you also see in the Metro North Care, uh, uh, Metro North Call Ahead application, where we're, tr we're trying to enhance the ways that our customers communicate with our employees, the conductors, people at the station, so that they have personnel on site ready to help them with any uh, 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 additional assistance that they may need. I think that is the end. Next slide. It's just an invitation for us to have a conversation. I spoke with Lisa uh, uh, earlier this week. And, and I told her how impressed I am by the work that the PCSC has already been doing, great conversations, great engagement in the community. I would like to, for us to discuss how I can be went to your sales and how we can collaborate to really see the MTA that we all want to build for the future. Thank you so much, Q. This is a great presentation and um, I, I can see tons of areas where we will work together uh, for the benefit of all of our riders. Um, one of the things on the railroads uh, that Phil Ang has pioneered on, the tr on his Long Island Railroad train time app is <clears throat> right on the app, you can see 
where the most crowded cars are. And this is being rebroadcast to station signs. So somebody who is disabled can see on the sign where there is room for them to go prior to the train's arrival, which is great. It's genius. Exactly. And, and you know, it's, it's something that I saw in Oslo uh, a year and a half ago. And, you know, I, I had conversations with Will Fisher and Phil Lang. And, and the first thing that they said to me was, it's already coming. It's coming to, to, to New York, we're working on it. And, and, and then COVID happened and how timely for, for us to be providing this information for, to our riders, absolutely. Just fabulous. Uh, we have a couple of hands. So um, let's see, Chris, Chris, right. If we can just really quickly, there was a question in the chat. Um, can we- I can, this is Chris. I'm actually at the one avenue right now. I'm sorry. Um, we, we need one at a time or we can't understand it. We'll get to the chat question in a moment. Chris, go ahead. Okay. Hi, Q. This is Chris. How are you, sir? I'm well, Chris. So good to hear you. Yes. I'm actually at Coney Island City and I was doing the math talk, but I'm taking a break so I can make sure I listen to the transit riders after the meeting. Um, the one thing I would say this to what your apprentice is doing, and you and I always work together, is to make sure that people with disabilities and seniors are all getting the accessibility that we need. With you know, with you working with us, and I'll say this would be a greatest honor because we have Alex, now we have you. And I will really, really will work with you to make sure that we will get more accessibility and more uh, even stronger buses to make sure we travel. So you know you got me to wherever you and I always can talk. And just to let you know, we do want to thank you in Brooklyn because having an H draft is just finishing up. They just opened the station. I just saw the signs up right now on the Q platform. So we hope that we can continue to bring up more ramps, elevators, and get more accessibility in. Especially more accessible ideas for this guy. Thank you so much, Chris. You, you know from working with me at DOT that I am a strong believer that the best programs, policies, and operations really come from working with the community, working with end users like yourself, and, and, and not only the people that you represent, but, but you as a transit rider, really helping us to see you know, where we need to go to, where, where we have room to grow, and, and the changes that we want to make happen. So thank you for your continued support. And I, and I will continue. I will continue. I will continue to the end. As Edith is, as Edith is not with us, I will continue to like I say, with all my heart and soul. Thank Hi, you. it's Trudy Mason. Hello. Since you say you can't see me raising my hand, um, Q. Yes, Trudy. Hi, Q. Uh, I just wanted to thank you on a personal level because, as you probably know, Edith and I not only we worked together all these years but she was a dear friend and I just want to thank you for your wonderful words and all that you have been saying about her and all the wonderful words and all you said while she was alive and she was so happy that you came when you came on board because she had she had a somebody who she could really just deal with and speak with and also happened to be a neighbor and on that level, I don't know if anybody has spoken to you about my idea, which I've now, which I discussed last month at, at this meeting about when, well, now I understand it may even be before, but naming the, um, the new elevator or the refurbished elevator at 181st Street, uh, the Edith Prentice Memorial Elevator. Thank you so much for that comment. Uh, uh, Hello? Yeah. Yes. Can, can you not hear me? No, now we I hear can you. hear you. I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I was just saying thank you so much for, for, for those words. You know, uh, I'll share it with, in this community here. Edith actually wrote a letter of recommendation for, for this job for me. So, so yeah, <laughs> uh, um, she really wanted me to take the role. She, she, she convinced me to leave the private sector and come back because mm -hmm. so much work had to happen here. But to your point about uh, naming you know it's something that we're all talking about we, we we don't quite know yet 
you know, what we'd like to do. A lot of the naming of stations and other of those physical assets actually have to come from the state. So we are looking for alternatives to ways that we can honor her ourselves without needing to involve the state uh, or, or others, though I know that her name is known even up north in Albany and that south in D.C. even. So, so we're definitely thinking about Q, that. I just want you to know that that oh, I just want you to know that that's already been I, I have a few contacts upstate also. And I've also spoken with uh, her. Well, both of them take credit for her and you will probably know who. But both Mark Levine and I'm always going to say it wrong. Uh, yeah. Uh, Idanos. 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 See, I always get it. Ayanos and Idanos. Idanos about doing this. And they both think it's a great idea. And also Maria Luna, who I'm sure you know. Yes. Who, who is now saying that it's her idea to do it. So it's gone the community board route. It's gone the city council route. I, I mean, and if you, whatever you can do to make it happen, I know it would mean that that elevator was, as you probably know, was so important to her. And she was so thrilled that it was finally going to be happening. And I, I just think it would be a, a great way to remember her and to, um, and I've discussed it with, with people uh, on this call, with, with uh, the RC people. And I think everybody is in agreement that, that it would be a, a great way to remember her for posterity. Great. Conversations are active, yes. Thank you. Okay, Andrew. thank you so much again for all that you're doing. Andrew, I- Thanks, Trudy. Uh, Andrew, I'd like uh, to- yeah, Stuart, um, can you just hold on half a second? Sure. Uh, Jasmine's had her hand up for quite a while. Go ahead, Jasmine. That's okay, I'm not on, on your board. Uh, so Q, uh, my name's Jasmine Melzer. I represent Good Neighbors of Park Slope. So we have 600 plus members who are all in the aging community. And uh, we're now going to be the beneficiaries of an elevator at 7th Avenue and 9th Street. So now I'm moving on to something else I brought up at these meetings for the last several years. And I certainly wrote to Sarah Barry about it. And I understand with ADA uh, requirements, it's difficult to do. But my question is the priority seating signs in the subways do not include older adults or those less able to stand. And I know that you can't necessarily change the signs um, like for the, the, those with disabilities, but I think there should be additional signs because uh, the audio announcements are not on all the lines and nobody's listening. So I would like to feel that when I'm standing on a subway, I can ask somebody to give me a seat because I'm standing in front of the seat that is for older adults and also if they did this, don't put it where people sit down so that you can't see the sign uh, when someone's sitting in your seat. So I just want you to come up with some way that older adults, pregnant women, etc., can ask for the seat without feeling shamed. Thank you. Jasmine, thank you so much for the question. It's definitely something that I've thought of before and I've had several conversations already with the team. We're working on something to that, to that effect. Uh, um, of course, there's regulations and other things that we have to review and make sure that we're not violating by, by doing so. But it would definitely agree with my definition of accessibility and, and my efforts to expand the accessibility needs. So I hear you. Thank you. Great. Stuart? Yeah, hi. Uh, Q, great presentation. Just an observation. The um, tactile strips that are at J Street, you know, like there was an illustration in the presentation. Um, they're great, uh, and yeah, we're you gotta get, yeah, perfect. Um, but those are bright and robust. But with cleaning and with um, people walking all over them, they've really faded. So I don't know whether your team is working with other uh, groups within the TA to explore other materials uh, because they've really faded and degraded. But when yeah, they, they have. when they were first issued um, for someone who uh, would rely on them, you couldn't miss them. But now they're really, they're, they're really uh, faded. And just wanted to make that observation. So if, if you're uh, assessing how effective they were, they really were at the beginning, but now they need a little <clears throat> tweaking. Uh, yeah, the, the, it's a great, great thing. 
thank you. Thank you for that comment. It actually has been something that we've already discussed today in one of my meetings earlier. Uh, we're really looking to, to see, you know, some permanent material that can convey this information. And, and we're absolutely having that conversation right now. Thank you. Yeah, perhaps one of the tiles, you know, you know, like uh, things could be embedded in the tile. That's, they, that's the direction we're, we're exploring. Right, right. But it's a great thing. Thank you. Yeah, anybody that, that saw that when it, when it was new and bright uh, was very impressed with it at J Street. It was great. Yeah. Uh, any other questions for, for Q? Mike, go ahead. Actually, um, I have a comment. Um, Q, I understand you are um, new to the job, but um, there is buses from 2008 to 2018 that does not have the um, digital the, um, digital audio navigational system for passengers. I mean, I know they got some on some buses, but not all. Yep, the, the, that's a very fair statement. It, it, it's something that I, I, I've heard before and, and that I see as I ride the bus, uh, um, you know, I, we don't all have access to, to a lot of these enhancements that we've seen. And we rely on, you know, th those brick and mortar announcements from the driver, communication from the driver to the passengers, particularly to the passengers with disabilities. It's something that we train for and, 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 and hope that our, our conductors remember every day. But yes, I hear you loud and clear. Until we fade out all our old assets, we're stuck with the system that doesn't provide equal access to every rider, depending on the bus they're on. Fair point. Okay. I just want to make sure that um, MTA President Sarah um, Feinberg go to every, check every depot to see which bus does have or does not have. Right. Like, she should go, she should keep checking um, Casey Stingle, Queens Village, and Baisley Park Depot. And, and we can raise that issue with Craig Cipriano also, Mike. Okay, okay. Craig, too. He can um, also check every depot. Yes. All and right. Mike, sorry if I can just chime in really quickly. This is Sarah from System Wide Accessibility. Um, sure. We are working with the depots to check and make sure that they have those, um, that we know which buses have them and which buses don't. And we're working with the buses, our division of buses, to make sure that the buses that don't have it are in either have a schedule to get retrofitted or that they'll be phased out in the new buses. So all new new buses have those DIS screens. It's automatically in that um, in their in their scopes. So hopefully yeah. in the near future, in the very near future, we should have a lot more buses with those screens. And the ones that you're talking about should be phased out. Yes. But we, are, we are working with our department of buses on that. I understand. I understand most of the new ones already have them, but it's the old ones from 2008 to 2000. 2018. Yeah, and the signage isn't the only issue with those old buses. <laughs> yes. um, so Ron, Ron had a question in the chat, and I have a question. Uh, yeah, let's well. do the chat question. Okay. Uh, Ron's question is, how about 88 Hunters Point Avenue, both L LIR and, T and Transit? So Hunters Point, Hunters Point Avenue and Hunters Point Avenue. Yeah, so on the 7 and on the LIRR. And I guess that would mean about making both of them accessible. And yes. this this is not the fix is not in. I just I did raise that as sort of an example when you and I spoke the other day, but we, Ron and I did not plan this. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, 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 at least the trust, I trust I I I I I totally understand and I hear you. And, and you know, it, it's something that we're we're working on. It's really you know how, how can we be more strategic in these enhancements, looking at the, the systems, the overlap. There's a lot of work to be done, and we're with C and D. We're all coming to the table to be more strategic and systemic in how we plan these enhancements. But but I hear you that the the work is yet to come. Thank you, because those are pretty bad, and it's a critical transfer point. Yep. Yeah. At one point, I think we had a um, a roadmap of when you know every station that was in the ca the capital plans uh, capital program to be updated to it 
to full accessibility. I don't have that in front of me now, but we can look and see where Hunter's Point was on that. I don't believe the Long Island station was on it, but the seven station was at some point. No, the, the Long Island Railroad station was as well. And I think that when the when C and D came and transformation um, really kicked up steam, I think that it changed to look at ways for economies of scale and as improvements to this to the purchasing and um, right. development of projects happen. So looking, you know, that would it can only be made better. The question and connecting is, when, the two in the process yeah, would be right. even better. Yeah, absolutely. Much, much so the, like the, connecting East New York with the L train Atlantic Avenue station would be wonderful. It's right there. Right, exactly. And besides yeah. the LIR station is rotting apart. It, it, yes, well, that's a that's another, there there are some, that's a, Ron, that's a question for another. Yeah, that's right another now. whole right. discussion. Um, um, I did Marisol want to ask about, ahead, oh, okay, Marisol. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Marisol, I'll go after you. I'm sorry. I'm trying to do this real quick before my dog starts barking. Um, I I am very impressed with the presentation. I think um, it goes a long way, not just for the disabled, but for the aging community. And um, I definitely appreciate all the steps moving forward. Just wondered if you could at some point share the slide. There's a lot of conversation going on about um, changes in the in the station as well as accessibility. Um, we. We just had the presentation on the Elevate Transit at our Bronx Borough Board. Um, so I, I'm glad to see the, the coordination that's occurring. I just would like to have the presentation and then maybe at some point have this presentation done at, on, a, on the borough wide level so that everybody is fully understanding of what MTA is doing as a whole for, for yep. um, the Accessibility. Marshall, it. Great, great, great questions. You know, earlier today we had another uh, uh, zoning for accessibility presentation with the disability community and, and a lot of the independent living, living centers throughout the city. You know, that, that team is undergoing over 59 community board uh, presentations. Uh, um, so, so there's a lot coming to each borough. Uh, um, and and the, to this presentation, we can absolutely share with you. Uh, um, Lisa, maybe we can communicate uh, uh, with Sarah to, to make this presentation available. Um, but yeah, Marisol, you know, check in with us and, and find, let, let's, let's make sure that you know when more zoning for accessibility conversation are happening in your borough. We'll definitely get that out to you and okay. can connect Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, I, sh I know, as you, Sharon has a question. May I just ask my question quickly? Go ahead. Okay. So you had mentioned that there is um, $5.5 billion in the capital program for accessibility projects, which is terrific. Um, I don't know if that includes the 70 stations um, or if that is an yeah. addition in, in it, or if that is, um, if that includes the 70, if that is also in looking at the um, commuter rail and how the state and the city $3 billion each fit into that envelope or if that's on top of it. So, so, so that money is everything that we had planned for this capital plan. That money was, again, under the assumptions that we had of, of the capital plan as we understood it before COVID. Uh, um, we are in active conversations to know what does that money look like from the city and state portions? Really, you know, t today I can say I, I do not have $5 billion anymore. I do not know what we have. And it's the same conversation for the MTA in general. Uh, um, it, it's a conversation that I'm having actually right now with, with people in the city at the DOT and also in the federal level, looking to see how we can find some advocates to, to spearhead conversations for us of finding monies in many different ways. Looking at Senator uh, 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 Tammy Duckworth to see, you know, who's interested in funding accessibility projects. There are $5 billion on the Biden's American Jobs Act and really understanding how those $5 billion for ADA will be put to use. And, and, you know, we're at the table ensuring that all these bills that are put forward are written in such a way that will make these monies accessible to us and will help us ensure that we can continue to move forward with the plans as we have them, which encompass that $5 billion uh, uh, total budget for this capital plan. Right. Well, please let us know how we can help. 
That's something yeah. that we that we can do. Absolutely, we'll do. Thanks, Lisa. Great. Uh, any other questions for Q? Sharon has her actual hand raised. I didn't see Sharon in the list of people at all, but okay. Sh Sharon? Also commend Q for a wonderful presentation and the progress that's being made. And I know he mentioned um, uh, tourists arriving from JFK and what have you, but in addition um, to adding to the uh, definition of disability, there are people from Penn Station and Grand Central and JFK and LaGuardia hauling luggage around. And that's another kind of disability, which I hope you can include in the definition um, to pay attention to. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, um, when, when I think of tourists, I'm thinking of tourists in all the different access points. And, and as someone who used to walk and used to carry luggage through Penn Station, I, I know the hardship. And, and, I, and that's why I include them in my definition of the people that I'm looking out for and the services that I'm hoping to provide. Great, thank you. Of course. Thank you so much. I think that is all of our questions. Great, well, thank you for um, the invite. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Q, and we'll be seeing you soon. Sounds good, Andrew, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank well. Much appreciated, thank you. thank you. Cheers. Okay. I think we're ready for uh, old business. Does anyone have any items of old business? Seeing none, Sharon, let us no, Sharon, Sharon has her hand. Sharon, there, now I see you. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I, this is just an old rant and rave of mine, and that is the police who are on duty are in clumps. At least one of them is on a, a cell phone engaged in what does not appear to be official business at 59th and Lex. Every morning, there are four or five of them for some reason at the uptown end and it's the downtown end, which has no um, booth where everyone is always jumping over the turnstile. And I just wish um, some care could be taken in where these people are dispersed when, during their terms of duty because um, I, the the fair jumping just really disturbs me, and I is see it at the, is it on the six line downtown at 59th? It's the, it's mostly the six line, you know, down underneath where um, on the south, the uptown, the, the downtown end of the uptown line. There's nobody there, and people just wait to get in, and they of wait course. For yeah. to come and open the door, and then I mean, so I'm the uptown sure. six, the southernmost entrance. Yeah, and, and okay. these guys are all hanging around up at the other entrance where there's a booth anyway. I'll report that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've seen a similar Just situation. General, it's frustrating. Everywhere you go, they're engaged in their little cell phones. Yeah, and really, anyway. Thank you. Andrew, I have um, old business. Go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, so I think at a prior session, I had asked about the cleaning schedule for stations. Uh, you know, I had acknowledged that as a writer, I see they're doing a wonderful job in the mornings um, and somewhat towards the tail end of the day with the cleaning of the trains, but I, I don't really see um, great progress at some of the major stations, certainly in the downtown area. And I mentioned this at a prior session. Did we ever get the cleaning frequency schedule or see how it changed? Uh, in the latter part of COVID? Um, I asked for it and yeah. don't believe I ever got it, but I've heard announcements saying that they're doing trains twice a day and stations twice a day, but I don't know what times those are. Okay. then I can ask again. Then Fulton Street on the AC uh, is still yep. very um, dirty. And um, I, I would just- You're finding that on all your trips there? It, it's, it's not clean, yeah. It's not cleaned with regularity. Okay, I'll speak to stations about that. At the station level and at the mezzanine level. Cause you know, you have sort of three mezzanines there. Oh yeah. And I'm not talking about the um, transportation center end of the station. Right, you're talking about the transit part. Right, and the William Street and uh, 
on the two three part. Yeah. Yeah. Is that both? Is that all times of day, Stuart? I see it during the morning and I see it during the evening. So uh, if something's happening in between and, and really downtown is still very scant with workers and with, with tourists. So, you know, I don't think much is happening with regularity at that station. I also, you know, West 4th Street and some other large stations, similar observations uh, since the last time I mentioned this. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the you know, if they're telling you that it's the frequency is X, you know, what are they actually doing? You know, I, I don't, I don't buy I'll it. I'll see if I can get the exact hours that these are cleaned. Yeah. Because something could happen between the morning and the, and the late afternoon or evening cleaning, because that is obviously a very busy complex with all those lines there. And there continues to be a significant proliferation of homeless uh, individuals uh, at that station. Uh, inside the transportation center and at the other end as well. Uh, right. So, um, thanks, Stuart. I, I will get you an answer. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Chris, I guess that's you. Yeah, I like to agree. I want to back up Stuart on this. This is not a joke, Andrew. This is a serious matter. So there are still stations that I do not see them sleep, but but I have mentioned this already, but there was also concerns of train cars themselves have not been cleaned. Because I see them cleaning more on the F and the B, but I don't see them cleaning much on the Q that much at Stewart Avenue. And times I may not, and, and there are times I can understand it's rush hour, but this is not rush hour. We're not ruining the midday. But if you can do please, you know, I see them, I see so many cleaners on the F platform, on the B platform, but I do not see them on the Q. I see okay, so Q there's, the N there's, a, there's the thorough cleaning that they do when the train is out of service. But then there's also the, the refuse removal they do when the train reaches the terminal. So don't confuse yeah, the two. Yeah. Well, either way, Andrew, as I was there doing the up map this morning, I, I don't see them cleaning when the up, when one up is not moving yet, but the other one's ready to leave. They clean that one like up the store on the F platform. Same as the D train. Very little. I do not see them cleaning the Q train. And there is concern of um, some littering on the Q, like, and all of these are leaving still well? Yes, it is. Okay, I'll report it. When I've, when I've done yes. um, mass course on the queue, I've seen them clean them very thoroughly up at night. So maybe they just clean them up one at all I'm just saying is, is it's going to, I'm not saying, I may agree with your saying, Lisa, yeah, 96 years, I may see them clean, but once they're here, that train needs to be cleaned on that because it's icy garbage. And you know the, community, the Brighton line is very heavy between going from in the Brighton line and Brooklyn. We will report these things. Yeah, this is my own business. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone with any items of new business? Sharon, is that uh, you? Andrew, I have new business. Oh, okay. So I'll make this very brief. All so right, there Andy. was a notable, there was a notable breakdown on the Q46 yesterday, 8470 at uh, Union Turnpike and 260th. So I'm just passing that note along. An audible breakdown? Is that what you said? No, oh, breakdown, breakdown. Just oh, the, the whole bus, bus breakdown. just broke down? Yep. Just passing it along. All right, and that uh, bus number was? 8470 at Union Turnpike and 260th Street. Okay, thank you. No problem. Any other new business? Um, no, is that you again, Chris? I said I did have new business. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Okay. 
a new business. Uh, is there going to be anything uh, regarding any plans that you're going to be doing in the next few months? Um, because as I was thinking what you were saying earlier, between Lisa or Andrew, you know, getting more passengers back on the trains, which I do see a lot more passengers than I've seen. But they use actors and actresses, they're good. But they should see us, the transit riders council members, and as well as the actors, the actor committee members, that's the building, and everyone that is really on the trains and say, we've been on the trains. Are you coming back to the train with us? We need to put something out as transit riders council. If it's possible. Um, once I once I learn more about this campaign to bring riders mm-hmm. back, I can have uh, I can ask if they can make a presentation to us. Absolutely. But can we also do announcements as well? Because if they see us as transit riders council members coming back on these trains, why can we also do it? You mean have a press conference on board? Is that what you're saying? No, I think Douglas is saying, can we make announcements? Can we do something, even posters or in some kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y